Hello, Paul Harvey fans. Brad Dyson here. I'm a car nut. I love cars. From the earliest horseless carriages to the newest electric cars, they all interest me. In my younger days, I would visit car lots just to dream. An eager salesman would undoubtedly come out and try to get me on the hook. In many instances, the salesman would twist my arm to get me to take a ride. Didn't take much arm twisting. Well, it wouldn't have been possible for me to buy even the most inexpensive car on their car lot, but I always enjoyed taking a test drive. Most of the time, these cars were ones that you'd see on the road every day, such as, you know, Fords and Chevrolets. But one day, I was daydreaming on a car lot when I saw a high-performance Porsche convertible. I couldn't help but gawk at this beauty. I was so enthralled with the car that I didn't see the salesman had been watching me for a while. We talked for a few minutes and the salesman asked if I wanted to drive it. Rather than jumping at the chance, I did something that I rarely, rarely did. I politely explained that I was only dreaming. There was no way I could afford a car such as this. There was no price sticker on the car, but he was determined that I take a drive in it. Finally, my arm twisted once again by a salesman. I took a drive. The salesman took the passenger seat and I got to drive. And oh boy, what a drive it was. I was totally relaxed, thoroughly enjoying myself. And eventually, out of curiosity, I asked the price of the car. I was no longer relaxed. The price was so high that I blocked it from my memory, but I couldn't wait to get back to the dealership and out of that Porsche. That was the last time I ever test drove a car that I knew I had no intention of buying. To tell you about another car lover, here's Paul Harvey. Now, the rest of the story. Ever since he could remember, Frank loved cars. When he was old enough to ask for toys, he asked for toy cars. When he was old enough to draw pictures, he drew pictures of cars. And then Frank turned 10. His father made a momentous announcement to the family they were going to buy a new car. There was a showroom in Brooklyn where they could see the latest model. Only a short drive from their home in Queens. They would go that very afternoon. Well, Frank could hardly contain himself. He'd not even been born when his parents had bought the car they now owned. So this was to be a brand new experience in young Frank's life. And most important of all, a shiny new car. Well, Frank was sitting up front with his father as they drove to the auto showroom. Can we take it home today? The boy asked eagerly. No, his father said this was not just a new car. This was a new make, an entirely new type of car. It had never been seen before anywhere. They'd have to make a down payment, place an order, and then when their new car rolled off the production line, it would be delivered to them. Of course, said his father, they would have to see the demonstrator model at the showroom first. They'd have to test drive it, and having done so, maybe they wouldn't even like the car after all. <laughs> well, they liked it. You bet they did. The demonstrator model was not just a car, it was a, it was a magic mobile. The most beautiful piece of sculpted machinery that Frank and his daddy had ever seen. Yes, they got to ride in it, and yes it was, like soaring on a cloud. Can we take it home with us, Dad? Well, his father needed no such encouragement. He had deposited $250 on the car, but the salesman said delivery would take a month or two. The family would even receive a three-piece matching set of luggage free with their purchase. So Frank and his father went home and thus began weeks of new car conversation and eager anticipation. His father believed so strongly in this new make of automobile that he personally invested in the company a sizable portion of his life savings. Stock was selling for $5 a share. So his father bought $10,000 worth, even urged other family members and friends to do the same. No way could they lose on this investment, he told them. The car was just too good to fail, too attractively designed, too mechanically superior, too advanced conceptually to be anything but a success in the American marketplace. Well, he was wrong. Turned out his father was wrong, not about the new car's superiority, but about its chances in a marketplace already monopolized by Detroit. At least that's the explanation most folks give for the failure of the car called the Tucker. You see, only a handful of Tuckers, 60 or so, were ever actually produced. 
Frank's father did not get one of them. He lost the car and his $250 deposit and his $10,000 investment, even his three-piece set of matching luggage. But Frank never forgot the shiny new chassis on the showroom floor. He vowed that someday he would own a Tucker, as his father had intended. That was four decades ago. And over the years since, Frank has fulfilled his dream. But one step better, he has told the Tucker story in a motion picture. And you're going to be seeing that movie this summer. And you may hear that its director, Frank Francis Coppola, had a special interest in his subject. And that is so. When you see the movie, if on the screen you notice what looks like real company stock certificates, they probably are. Francis Coppola's father, Carmine, gave his son $10,000 worth as a memento. So four decades later, that stock really is worth something after all. And now you know the rest of the story. I've only seen Tucker torpedoes, as the 48 Tucker is often called, in museums, but they always impressed me. They were so far ahead of its time. The most recognizable feature is that rather than having two headlights to light the way, the Tucker had three, one on each side and one directly in the center. The center headlight was connected to the steering. The center headlight turned to the right when the car was steered to the right and left when the car was steered to the left. At the time, 1948, 17 states had laws which prohibited more than two headlights on automobiles. That's kind of odd. The Tucker came with a cover for the middle headlight for use in those states. Based on the information about the movie Tucker, The Man in His Dream that Mr. Harvey provided, this episode was broadcast in 1988, the year the movie was released. You can see the very car that Mr. Harvey spoke about in this episode. A picture of the Tucker in the winery is on your screen right now. But if you want to see it in person, this very 1948 Tucker is on public display inside the Francis Ford Coppola Winery in Geyserville, California. I'm Brad Dyson. Thank you very much for watching. And as Paul Harvey would say, good day.